This is the Gigabyte E350N, which I bought a while back because it seemed sort of odd, and I like odd hardware. I figured, considering its small size, HDMI port, and overclocking ability, I could probably find an interesting way to put this to use. But before that, we'll need to get it cleaned up and tested. If you want to see what this board can do, stick around. Like I said in the beginning, this is the Gigabyte E350N, and I bought it for about $30 on Facebook Marketplace. It's a mini ITX motherboard that features a soldered on AMD E350 APU. The E350 is a mobile APU released by AMD in Q1 of 2011 and was actually included in AMD's first release of APUs, which is the term they use to describe a system on a chip that includes both the CPU and GPU. This chip only has two cores and two threads clocked at 1.6 GHz, so I'm pretty doubtful that it will be able to handle Windows 10 very well. The Gigabyte E350N technically supports overclocking, but we'll get to that a bit later. We probably won't be doing much gaming or anything with the Radeon HD 6310 graphics, but it should support H.264 decoding using AMD's UVD3 decoder. The motherboard has standard ATX 24-pin and 4-pin power connectors, two DDR3 slots, as well as a PCIe slot. But wait, that's not a PCIe slot. Yep. That's a good old-fashioned PCI slot. You might be thinking, you're an idiot for spending $30 on a system with a 10-year-old dual-core mobile CPU and a PCI slot, and you're correct. You see, what had happened was I actually thought I was buying the Gigabyte E350N-USB3. This is a very similar board, but it has quite a few better features, such as 6 gigabit per second SATA ports, USB 3.0 ports, a few more audio video outputs, as well as a PCIe 2.0 slot. The board I bought has 3 gigabit per second SATA ports, no USB 3 at all, and a PCI slot. The seller of this board listed it as the USB 3 version and even included a screenshot of a listing for it. He posted a couple pictures of the actual motherboard, but they were pretty low quality and I wasn't incredibly observant. And also I had no idea at the time that the lower quality model even existed. When we met up, it was incredibly cold and windy, so I didn't observe it closely in an attempt just to get back in my car. Later on I found out that I had the wrong board as well as a broken R7 240, which I talked about in a different video. Based on sold eBay listings of this board, I probably spent too much, but I think it'll still be fun to take a look at it, and the E350 APU is the same in both models, so we're not missing too much. Before we get to testing this board though, we really need to clean it up. It clearly belonged to a smoker at some point, as it has the telltale layer of grime all over it, as well as the very distinct smell. This assembly should be very straightforward. We'll start by removing these two screws that hold the fan in place, then remove the fan cable, and then finally the fan itself. Then we can flip the whole motherboard over to remove these last two screws here that are holding the heatsink in place. With the two screws removed, the heatsink should just fall right off. Now we have access to the die of the APU itself, as well as the heatsink. Next, we'll spray some isopropyl alcohol on the APU, refocus the camera, spray some more isopropyl alcohol for the camera, and then we can use a spudger to start scraping off the thermal paste from the APU die. And then after the spudger, we can come back with a Q-tip to make sure it's squeaky clean. We can also use the spudger to chisel away any of the thermal paste that's on the heatsink itself, which has clearly been on here a long time because it's very hard and dry. And we'll also use a Q-tip to get this squeaky clean as well. Some of this black foam is starting to come off, but it shouldn't be that big of a deal. As always, we'll use compressed air to try to spray out any dust, but because this was a smoker computer, a lot of it just likes to stick onto it. So rather than using compressed air, I'm primarily using a paintbrush to try to knock off as much as I can before coming back with more isopropyl alcohol to clean it up. We'll use quite a bit of isopropyl alcohol on the motherboard and then use a soft toothbrush to go through and try to scrape away as much of the grime, dirt, and dust as we can. I didn't show the back of the fan earlier, but it's pretty bad, so I'll just go through with a Q-tip and some isopropyl alcohol and clean each of the blades one at a time, as well as the shroud around the fan, and the final result is pretty solid. It's looking good. Trying to get down into the heatsink with a paper towel or Q-tip is tough, so instead I'm just going to use this brush and some dish soap to scrub everything out, and then after it dries off, it's looking pretty good. 
Once the heat sink was completely dry, it was time to put some thermal paste on the die and then come back with the spudger and make sure we spread it out nice and evenly. I forgot to grab some extra paper towels, so I'm just going to tear off some of my test bench here to clean up my spudger, and now we can go ahead and put the heat sink back into place. All I have to do here is line up the screws with the screw holes on the bottom of the heat sink, flip it over, and then tighten those screws back until they're snug. Then we just plug the fan back into the header on the motherboard and use the two screws to screw it back into the heat sink. And after this, we're done. Now we can put our motherboard on our test bench and then add in our $5 Amazon Find 240 watt power supply, a 128 gig SSD, four gigs of DDR3 RAM, and then lastly, a monitor. Now we can short the power header pins and see if this posts. With the system now ready to go, we can jump into Windows 10. And well, this is about what I expected with a decade old, low power, dual core CPU. Our poor cores are essentially locked at 100% utilization when doing just about anything. Web browsing is miserable. Opening applications takes many seconds or even minutes. And even just launching task manager is a chore. YouTube playback isn't really a thing. I tried using H.264 Fi to force the H.264 codec, but it doesn't really seem to matter. The integrated Radeon graphics should technically support H.264 decoding, and I installed the most recent, although now unsupported, drivers, but for some reason, video playback just isn't working on this machine. I also tried playing an MP4 using VLC Media Player as well, just to make sure it wasn't an issue with Google Chrome, but that yielded a very similar result. As per usual, I ran the PC Mark 10 benchmark, and we got a score of 1526 in the Essentials category and 1059 in Productivity, which is not that great. I also ran Cinebench R15, and we got a 3-run average score of just 46. Okay, so things aren't looking so great right now, but maybe the power draw of this board will be low enough to justify the lackluster performance. But unfortunately, the E350N pulled around 32 watts from the wall when idle, and 40 watts while under full load. Now obviously our $5 power supply might be at some fault here, but it's technically designed for a low-end system, and so I don't really think it's the primary culprit. While the power draw for the entire system wasn't great, the CPU actually managed to stay fairly cool, hitting 17 degrees Celsius above ambient at idle, and 30.5 degrees Celsius above ambient under full load. Now I mentioned earlier that this board actually has the ability to overclock, and since our temps look pretty good, we might have room to push this chip a bit further. So let's see what we can do. You can use either the BIOS or the EasyTune 6 app from Gigabyte to dial in the overclock settings. I use the BIOS primarily because I had a few hiccups early on with the app. While I was initially hopeful about being able to push this chip, my hopes were immediately dashed when I realized there was no way to manually adjust the CPU voltage. This meant that I could increase the clock speed, but couldn't raise the voltage to try and ensure stability. Because of this, I was only able to get about a 100 MHz overclock on the CPU and have it stable. I also added another 4 GB of RAM and overclocked it from 1066 to 1333 mega transfers per second. While these are only marginal improvements, I really just wanted to give this board a fighting chance, so I reran our benchmarks with the overclock. In PC Mark 10, we actually had a pretty substantial improvement, scoring 1899 in the Essentials category and 1193 in the Productivity category. In Cinebench R15, we scored a 3-run average of 51. I wasn't expecting a big increase in power draw since we couldn't even change the CPU voltage, and that's exactly what happened. We pulled 33 watts from the wall at idle and 42 under full load. Our CPU temps went up a little bit as well, hitting 22 degrees Celsius above ambient at idle and then maxing out at 34.5 degrees Celsius above ambient under full load. I really wish we had the ability to adjust the CPU voltage here because we have so much thermal headroom that we don't have the ability to take advantage of. I wasn't expecting much with this board, in terms of performance at least, but I was really hoping that the power draw would at least be pretty low. It might not seem like that much, but this board uses substantially more power than something like the A6 5200 that we looked at a little while back in the Pavilion 500-A60. 
The quad-core A650-200 was over twice as fast as the E350 in a lot of the benchmarks we ran, while pulling fewer watts at full load than the E350 pulls at idle. While my story is very much anecdotal, I was still able to get the Pavilion 500-A60 for less than half the price of what I paid for the E350N, which really just goes to show how dumb of a purchase this was. I imagine that this machine could easily run something like Home Assistant or Plex, but because of the poor efficiency, I don't think I could recommend it to use for a home server of any sort, unless one just literally lands in your lap, and you also don't mind paying a little bit more on your electricity bill. I obviously don't think that this is a good machine for basic computing and web browsing either, but I do think there might be one role it could play. Because of its small size and HDMI port, I think it might be cool to try to turn this into some kind of small retro console emulator. It would only run occasionally, so the power draw really isn't an issue. So the only question at that point would be, could it actually run something like Laka? But that's a video for another time. While this board isn't great, and I definitely wouldn't recommend buying it at all really, it was still quite a bit of fun to clean it up and just see what it could do. And who knows, maybe you have an idea of something we could do with it that I haven't thought of. And if so, leave it in a comment below. And if you want to support the channel, hit the like button, or maybe even consider subscribing. But for now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.